I'm Dr. Alessandra Rosa. I'm a social cultural anthropologist, and I work at University of South Florida in the Department of Sociology. I was able to collaborate with the USF uh, MAC Contemporary Art Museum exhibition when we, um, through the VS, uh, NSF study that I uh, was doing through the postdoc. So our NSF study, National Science Foundation grant, um, provided funds to work with Dr. Elizabeth Aranda and part of the other research team. And we collaborated with a nonprofit organization called Mujeres Restrada por Dios, um, set in Tampa, like really close to USF. And they were caught in the midst of helping uh, post-disaster migration from Puerto Rico after hurricanes, particularly Hurricane Maria, and how they uh, were adapting or settling into the Tampa Bay area. Every migration story is different, and every experience uh, that we saw was definitely very particular. However, we were focusing on the people that needed economic assistance. Some of the research that we looked at um, was, you know, things like needing English classes, they needed affordable housing, childcare, etc. And through this research, I was able to uh, get in contact with some of the USF uh, Museum. And they were looking actually to bring artists from uh, Puerto Rico and from the diaspora as well to collaborate right into this uh, notion of what disasters mean, navigating disasters. And we also decided to create the symposium where, you know, the art world and, and students and, and professors and scholars can actually meet and discuss more broadly what these themes uh, meant in our lives. The paper that I presented there was, uh, is a published paper that we came out uh, through the data of the research that we did called Cascading Disasters, right? And we looked at not only the issue of uh, Hurricane Maria, but also the existing vulnerabilities that there were in, in Puerto Rico prior to the hurricane, then the hurricane, then the migration to a new area like the Tampa Bay area and what that meant, right? You're, we're not crossing political borders because we're U.S. citizens, but we're definitely crossing cultural and linguistic um, borders. So what that meant for the people and then not only that migration, but also COVID exposure and when the pandemic hit. So that's why we call it the cascading disaster effect. And, you know, that's part of the research that we presented and we're looking at and we're continually still publishing to this day from, you know, it was almost two years worth of data that we were able to um, rec recollect. So we're still coming out with new patterns and new ways of looking at, you know, even the notions of what is home, you know, and, and what you bring with you and what reminds you of Puerto Rico, whether you have a flag, you have you drink the coffee, whether it's that you listen to the music or just speaking Spanish at home, right? So all of these things is, is uh, part of the research that we're looking at. And we just presented like a little glimpse at the museum. Many of them for sure was losing, um, you know, their house, their home, their things. They had to start over. So part of the notion is, you know, if you're already barely making it in Puerto Rico, is why not try it in the U.S., right? You know, again, the, the so-called American dream that a lot of people and migrants are chasing. But once they get here, they realize that it might not necessarily be so positive and easy as it was um, thought to be, right? They might be confronted that they actually cannot speak English or maybe their certification is not valid. They need to get a state certification to be able to uh, practice, right, their profession. So these are certain things that they have um, kind of been confronted with as they migrated to, to Tampa Bay area. With their kids in particularly, um, they did have to navigate like even the school zones, right? It's very different, um, the public education system here um, in comparison to Puerto Rico. But then at the same time, uh, when COVID hit, a lot of them, if they did not know that much English, um, they were confronted with uh, having to teach their children, right? And some of them were not able to do that. So, so that was definitely a big 
frustration for them saying like I'm the parent I should be able to help my children with their schoolwork and I'm not able to do so so that definitely did become something heightened another problem that they faced was child care in Puerto Rico if they were they had a family network they were able to get some family members to take care of their children while they work but yet when they come here they're confronted that their family network is you know separated is divided so they were not able to have somebody take care of their children and then let's say they do get a job but if their children get sick or whatnot so there's still uh, a lot more challenges that they had not uh, been exposed to while living in Puerto Rico you also have the other side if they want to put their children on child care more than half of their paycheck would have gone to pay for child care because you have ranges I think the cheapest one you can find is like $700 a month so if you think of uh, child care rent you know any utilities that you have any cell phone or internet or trying to keep like the basic um, things that we need nowadays especially during the pandemic you definitely see that childcare was one of those expenses that they needed to learn to do without um, and juggle what that meant we definitely did have some cases that had some friends or relatives somewhat close by some of the those people or relatives lived in orlando or a little bit farther down like brandon or whatnot but they were somewhat close that they could, in the case of an emergency, help out. In the day-to-day, -day, if they lived in Orlando, it's a little bit harder unless they move a little bit closer. Um, and there was some that they actually came to Florida because they already had some family members here. So within that, you also have the cases that some of those relationships got a little bit um, got a little bit of a friction. It's not the same thing as you coming over to stay or visit your family member or friends or when you're actually caught living with them for a long amount of time until you're able to try to pay rent or get a job or whatnot. So, so some of the relationship, even when they were here, um, got eroded a little bit because um, there was a saying that really like struck to me um, that came out in a couple of the interviews was like el muerto de, después de tres días apesta a corpse stinks after three days so if you live with your family members for a long amount of time you're going to be associated right to the body of a dead corpse um, so again a, even if they had the network it wasn't necessarily something um, more long-term positive some cases it was in some cases it wasn't um, and that's when they had the network they feel a little bit more comfortable coming here the plane tickets are cheaper tend to be cheaper <laughs> um, you can always fly back it's just two hours two hours and a half right the the flight so that's one thing the weather for sure we kind of learned from the previous migration <laughs> that if you want to go to the north it's going to take a little bit more um, adapting to that as well um, here you also have southern Florida, central southern Florida has a lot more um, Latine, Latinos, Hispanics, you know, whatever the term Latinx, Latine. And so you are able to hear a little bit more Spanish, um, which is also very a little bit more familiar than if you go to northern Florida or above Florida, right? Sometimes this was where the plane ticket took them, right? Because FEMA paid for a ticket and they had health issues and they landed in Moffitt here at USF. So some reasons um, it was chosen, other reasons they ended up here. Um, and then once here, then they're kind of trying to figure it out. You see all of these cases in the interviews that we did. So you see people that actually came here but had family members in the North, went to the North said like, oh no, I cannot live here and then came back to Tampa. Some actually moved after being in Tampa to a state in the north like Pennsylvania, but then after a while realized they couldn't deal with it and came back. Um, some definitely have used Tampa or this area as a springboard to leave to other states because around here you can tell the, the housing is definitely 
going off the roof um, and even in Orlando area as well. So, so it, it, it has definitely seen these patterns in the people that we interviewed, but we've also seen people that um, have gone back to Puerto Rico. Between this, I want to differentiate to some that came more on a temporary notion, like they knew they were only going to come here due to the emergency situation, and then they were going to return back to Puerto Rico. Um, others, because they couldn't make it in, in Tampa Bay area, find a home or whatnot, um, they had a home with the problems that it had, like cracks from the earthquakes that happened also in 2020. Um, they decided that they could survive better in Puerto Rico than what they were doing here. So you, it's, as I said, it's, every experience is different. You have others that came here and were able to make it, you know, and they are, they're already bought a house and they're very settled here. But then you have all these other nuances, right, that come out that people from here go to different state or come back or stay in those states or go back to to Puerto Rico for for those different reasons, right? So so it's definitely um, something that we've seen, and I know that it happens um, throughout. Uh, you know, not just focus in Florida, but like even the Puerto Ricans that maybe lit, went directly to New York uh, after the hurricane, right? So they could have used that as a springboard as well, or to return back to Puerto Rico once the emergency passed, or move to a different state. Some people that. Um, have come right because one of the like the spouse has a health condition and like I said they came to Moffitt they were sent by FEMA to Moffitt um, they're get, being treated but then they're uh, in this case the wife it doesn't have health insurance and she's also elderly and but she's not a city, senior citizen yet so she's not able to afford health care and how she's navigating that even going so far as having to choose which medicine she can buy with the with the social security check that she receives right so so these are definitely issues that came up um, we do have on a positive side unfortunately uh, special needs education in Puerto Rico um, has not received the funding that it needs so I had some cases of students that have come with certain accommodations that they needed in their schooling that here, once they moved, they were able to get access to those services. So that was a, a, a positive side. Because um, you can definitely feel it in the mother's voice. Like, you know, my child needed this. And here, you know, the counselor and this have been able to work with us to, to have him. And I've seen an improvement in his education, right? So, so there are not always negative um, consequences of moving or or different um, experiences but there's also some positive when we talk about lessons learned that's why we do part of the research that we're doing to be able to impact policy and policy change uh, for a better outcome for the future not just for Puerto Ricans in this case but for all migrants because we've seen that um, climate refugees are increasing um, nowadays with all of the you know, you have the fires, you have the tsunamis, you have the hurricanes, you have earthquakes, you name it, right? And it's only getting worse. So in this case, even though we are focused on the Puerto Rican migrants experience post-disaster, it is really applicable, uh, the factors that they needed to be able to adapt to this new environment are very applicable to all that come here, right? If you don't have money, you need access to an affordable housing that the Tampa Bay area needs to develop more. Affordable child care, um, depending where the migrant is coming from, maybe access to some English classes, um, a little bit of help with the paperwork of transferring over your license, where to get it, whatnot, and also health care, right? Their uh, children were able to get the, until I think you're 18, um, you get uh, health coverage from the government. But then what happens to the mother or the father, right? If they can't afford it. So these little loopholes that, that if we make it a little bit more accessible for people to get these um, kind of like safety nets, because we all need this to be able to survive and, and, and not only survive, but like thrive, like really be um, 
successful citizens, right? And, and what we know as successful, like just be able to get a job, pay your bills, you know, put your children through school and whatnot. Um, but in a way, I feel like we are not there yet. Um, that's the frustrating part after doing the research and, and seeing the numbers that, that the policy hasn't, hasn't changed to adapt to what that could mean, right? In this case, um, that's why some of the people have had to return to Puerto Rico and yet Puerto Rico has not learned the lessons either. Um, so that's kind of, I would say, the very frustrating part of doing this type of research. Um, because you want to impact the people's life in a positive way and you have the data to back it up, but then you don't see it, the action to, to really improve people's lives. I definitely feel we have a move a little bit closer in those steps because we have been able to meet with um, like the major and certain people uh, that are, you know, in the political scenario that can help influence the, the, that policy change. I don't feel we're there yet. Um, I don't know if we're going to get there soon um, either. I would hope so because that's kind of what we were pushing for. But I definitely feel like we still need to, unfortunately, in, in, like do a little bit more pressure so they can definitely then say like, okay, this is definitely needed. We need to get going on this, you know, and not just say like, oh yeah, I see your research. Wow, this is what you need. Well, let me see what funds I can get to, to see how I can impact it or when can I impact it or, you know, so it's like a more slow progress. And at, at right now with all of the, you know, the, the different climate issues that I mentioned, we cannot take that slow step forward you know we need to make drastic changes and we need to make them fast in order to be able to help these people um, in general not just puerto rican um, migrants puerto ricans are u.s citizens so technically we should have an easier <laughs> easier time adapting and settling into the u.s society um, not maybe like other La Latinx or Latin American um, immigrants or European immigrants because they're not U.S. citizens. However, uh, one thing that I definitely keep emphasizing is we study Puerto Ricans as migrants and as part of a diaspora because of our experiences here um, are very similar, right? We, a lot of our participants went through uh, moments of discrimination. They went they lived through moments of racism. They lived of moments that they, you know, I had this older lady, she's like, I really didn't understand what they were saying to me because like, she didn't knew English. She just felt the negative energy and that it was something bad because they were screaming at her. And she's like, I just send them blessings and I went on my way, right? So when we, even in our research, when we talk about the Puerto Rican post-disaster migrant experience, we talk about it as a migrant experience precisely because of the experience it's very much related to what other migrants experience um, not as u.s citizens but it's not a lot of people might call it second class citizenship but it's not a legally second class citizen there's research that shows that it's more in terms of locality but that's a whole different subject